Hello and welcome to our show where I interview people who have something to say about the world today and how it's changing. They'll be from politics, sport, business, entertainment, public life, or they'll be everyday people caught up in the events of our times. On this week's show, one of America's most senior diplomats, plus a mother seeking help and answers after her daughter was killed in a hit and run in Qatar. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman has worked under Presidents Clinton, Obama and Biden. She's been face to face with Vladimir Putin and was a key voice in the room during nuclear talks with Iran. We'll discuss the United States' hopes for an end to the war in Ukraine, fears that Tehran could be one step closer to building a nuclear bomb and Joe Biden's chances of re-election in 2024. Also, the victim of a hit and run and the grieving family who feel forgotten. I'll speak to the mother of Rafi Sakanika, who was killed in Qatar in 2019. Jo Sullivan, her mum, has been fighting for answers from the Doha authorities ever since. Her partner, who helped build stadiums for the World Cup, lost his job during their campaign. They now want a meeting with the Foreign Secretary. First, though, 2023 is set to be a pivotal year for the US and its diplomacy. President Joe Biden has suggested he could meet with Vladimir Putin if the Russian president is looking for a way to end the war in Ukraine. There's also the possibility of a presidential visit to Northern Ireland. But could that trip be overshadowed by ongoing tensions between Britain and the EU over Brexit? That's where I started my conversation with the US Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman. Madam Deputy Secretary, thank you uh, for being on Sky News for this uh, trip to London and other parts of Europe as well. I wanted to start off by asking you about something that matters to us Brits and also to the Americans. Next year will mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. The President's due to visit potentially Northern Ireland to mark that moment. How important is it that the Northern Ireland protocol issue is resolved by then? Well, I think we all want to see the issue resolved. Uh, President Biden spoke with uh, your new prime minister. And I think we all have optimism that an agreement can be reached. It's very important from an American perspective to reach an agreement. And I think people are working very hard uh, to get there. It's terribly important. And back then, then President Bill Clinton, who you know well, mm -hmm. uh, closely, was closely involved in those negotiations to keep talks going. Does President Biden stand ready to get involved in the same way if necessary? I think America's always ready to support um, the United Kingdom. You know, we have a special relationship. There's no denying that. Uh, I've started this trip to the capitals of Europe and I began in London. Um, this is an incredibly rich relationship now we're sorry that we are not in the final games of uh, the football <laughs> match. And I did mean to start by congratulating England on its win against Senegal and now coming into the finals. I know it'll be quite a match on Saturday. And I can tell you that Americans are now, uh, as we say, soccer crazy, uh, football crazy. So we'll be watching uh, with eager eager interest. And I, I should say, Madam Deputy, the USA uh, fought a valent fight as well and got through to the qualifying stages, getting knocked out the other night. But I have to ask you now, you've mentioned it, uh, <laughs> on the special relationship, France versus England, uh, who would you like to win? Um, whoever uh, <laughs> comes out first. Uh, I think it's going to be a tough match. Uh, we were very excited to get into the final rounds and we have a young team. I think they'll come back the next time even stronger. And you know, I had an event at the State Department on our eighth floor, which is our big rooms. 
I even had a soccer jersey that the U.S. soccer team gave me, said Sherman won. <laughs> we invited all the diplomatic corps, had big screen TVs. There is just football madness in the United States as there is around the world because I think sports brings people together. Uh, so we're very excited to watch on that Saturday. That was a very diplomatic answer because you're, of course, going to Paris next. So, <laughs> <Yes>. so, <laughs> so maybe wise not to come out in favour of England, but I might ask you afterwards. Uh, President Biden said last week he was prepared to speak to Mr Putin if, in fact, there was an interest in him deciding he's looking for a way to end the war in Ukraine. He hasn't done that yet. He went on to say the only way for that to happen would be for President Putin to pull out of Ukraine number one. What does pull out mean? Does it mean the withdrawal, too, from Crimea? I think that we have always said nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. And the United States and uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, have been side by side in this effort. Um, I'm really just so grateful for everything that Britain has done to support the Ukrainians, America as well, $53 billion uh, to date in our security assistance and uh, additional humanitarian support. Uh, so we have a lot ahead of us. And what's important here is there is one aggressor and that's Vladimir Putin and one victim, and that's Ukraine. We've seen the Ukrainians uh, will not be victims. They're going to fight for their country, and it's why we all support them in every way we possibly can. I think there's tremendous support here, and there's tremendous support in America uh, to get to the end here. This can end if Vladimir Putin pulls his troops out. But Deputy Secretary, just quickly to follow up on that, um, President Zelensky's made it really clear that territorial integrity means Crimea, which was annexed in 2014, being returned to Ukraine. Just to be clear, the US would support that? We support President Zelensky. We support the Ukrainian people. It's not for us to decide what any negotiated solution would be at the end. It is really up to the Ukrainians. Do you see the war ending next year? Are you hopeful for that? I'm hopeful the war ends as quickly as possible. I think everybody does. I think Ukrainian people want the war to end. They are the ones who have suffered so enormously. Just imagine uh, the loss of life, the loss of infrastructure, the loss of whole villages and towns and cities. And Dr. Secretary, if, if Putin isn't scary enough, Iran's nuclear ambitions continue to grow. You negotiated the Iran nuclear deal under President Obama. President Biden promised to revive it. It hasn't happened. Instead, Iran has enriched more uranium than ever before and elected a hardline new president. Is Iran closer to a nuclear bomb than it's ever been? We're in a very tough place. Uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, is still on the table, but it's unfortunately not on the agenda right now because one, the Iranians really did not take the very good deal that was on the table, negotiated by the P3, by the Europeans, uh, with the United mm -hmm. States in another hotel during it. And indeed, um, we've seen uh, protests in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen Iran give UAVs to Russia uh, to prosecute this unprovoked and premeditated invasion of a sovereign country, Ukraine. Um, so there is a lot going on right now. We also have detained uh, Americans who are wrongfully detained in Iran that we are trying uh, to get home to their families. But, a lot but, going on here. But, uh, what about the regime? We've had widespread reports. We've seen it about protests and brutal repression. Diplomatic sources are telling Sky News they believe the regime is finished. It's just a question of time before it goes. Is that your reading of the situation too? My reading of the situation is certainly that the people of Iran have said they have had enough, uh, that they want a different way forward. That is for them to decide, not for outsiders to decide. We want to support those who are protesting in every way we can uh, so that they can make their own choice about their own future. And just finally, the special relationship. The British Prime Minister made a foreign policy speech last week and said nothing about the special relationship. Isn't it the truth that when the British pre Prime Minister, who normally likes to trumpet this, uh, forgets to mention the special relationship, then it's probably a concept that's had its day? No, what I think it says is we are who we are with each other. We do not need to continue to name it, even though I've mentioned it today, uh, because it just is. 
Uh, we are, have such a deep history with each other. We have such a, an alliance with each other. And you know, when President Biden became president, one of the things he said he was going to do was really put a focus on alliances and partnerships mm -hmm. because nothing in this world can be done by yourself. Even if America leads on any given issue, we cannot do it alone. We will always be doing it with others, and we will always have Great Britain with us, is side it, by side, hand in hand. Just quickly, is it easier with the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, than it was with Boris Johnson or Liz Truss for President Biden? Uh, we are very delighted to have your Prime Minister and look forward to working with him. He's just getting started. We have a lot of good work we're going to do ahead. Now we're completely out of time. I'm going to push my luck if I may. One final question. <laughs> Donald Trump is running in 2024. Can President Biden really repel that challenge and push on into a second term when he will be in his mid-80s? Well, that'll be a decision that President Biden will make and the American people will ultimately decide on the president. I work for President Biden. I'm a strong supporter of his. I will say that if you look at our midterm election, mm you will see that a lot of folks who had denied uh, the outcome of our last election lost. Mm. So I think the American people are speaking about the kind of future they want. And I was in Mexico City the day after our election. Everybody asked me what I thought about the winners and losers. Mm. And I said the winner was democracy. Democracy won on our election day because we had a smooth, free, open, transparent, and solid election. You'd like him to run, though, I get. I'm gathering. You'd like him to I'm go second time. I'm a big fan time. of President Biden. Okay. Madam Deputy Secretary, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us on Sky News today. Thank you. Thank you. Three years ago, Jo Sullivan experienced every parent's worst nightmare when her daughter Rafi failed to come home after a night out. It transpired Rafi had been killed in a hit and run by a man driving almost 120 miles an hour. Afterwards, there was no knock on the door from the police. Jo only discovered her daughter's death after searching hospitals and eventually a mortuary. Her killer was eventually brought before the courts and given a sentence of two months in prison. This week, a UK coroner criticised the Qatari authorities for not cooperating with his investigation. He apologised to the family, citing a lack of evidence, and said he could not rule that Rafi was unlawfully killed. Jo, thanks so much for coming to talk to us today and telling us the story about your daughter, Rafi. Before we get into what happened, I'd first like to get your reaction to the inquest verdict. The coroner was hugely sympathetic with your case, but had to conclude on the evidence that he had that Rafi was the victim of a road traffic accident and not the victim of an unlawful killing. What's your reaction to that? Um, so, yes, it was disappointing, but we completely understand the decision he had to come to. I mean, he had very limited information to go on, so it, it was kind of almost expected, really. Do you feel very angry, though, at the failure of the Qatari authorities to provide information and assistance to help that coroner that, as you said, there was not really much else he could do but to come to that verdict. Yes, they've had many an opportunity. Um, we've approached them continuously. Our, our advisor, Rad Ziger, has approached them. Um, the coroner has contacted the Qatari authorities for information and they've completely ignored everybody. And Rad, who's your, your lawyer, uh, he, he's written um, to the Foreign Secretary today. What, what's he said and what, what are you asking them for? Do you want a meeting? Yeah. He's calling for a meeting with the FCDO and um, uh, James Cleverly to uh, reopen this. We, we want more information that we know the Qataris have. And the Foreign Office told us, Joe, that they'd offered support in the aftermath of Rafi's death and that they raised her case with the Qatari authorities at a senior level. Is that your experience? Do you know any conversations took place? So uh, it was very minimal, uh, and it, they were basically pushed and forced to to, to ask for questions. Um, we still don't know to this day whether uh, Mubarak al-Hajri has served his pitiful two-month sentence. In one 
communication. We were told, yes, he has, and then a, a week later we were told he hadn't. So we still don't have any answers. And that was the man that was driving the car yes. that hit, yeah. hit Rafi's car. Yeah. I want to go back to the beginning, if I may, and um, Rafi, your daughter, you've described her as your best friend, yeah. so you were very... Very close. Very close. Yeah. And we've got some yeah. footage that you sent in, actually, which I think we can see with, with, of you two dancing together at home in, in Qatar. There you are. Um, it's, it's, it's lovely to see it, but it must be hard uh, to see it as well. Um, that was our apartment in Qatar. And you spent a lot of time together. You were very close. Yeah. And very you did much. a lot of dancing. Dancing, singing laughing, she'd find something funny and everything. You and your family are originally from... There you are in the car. We're singing to Sean Paul. <laughs> You're doing a bit of carpool karaoke there. Yeah. We loved it. She knew all the words and I'd just make the noises. She looks like a... She looks like she is full. She is brimming with life and having fun, yeah. right? She's just an, an asset to the world. Everybody loved her. Thank you for sharing those videos and uh, showing us, Rafi, you, you're clearly a very close mum and daughter yeah. unit. If we can, let's go back to the 30th of March 2019. That's the day your life changed forever. Yeah. And it was just a normal, it was just a normal day for you. What were you and Rafi doing that day? Um, so we had friends around for dinner. It's the 29th and evening. We had uh, friends around for dinner. And um, Raf had already arranged to go out with a friend for coffee, yeah. so she left us about 7.30. She yeah. said she wouldn't be late because we were going... We had, like, several buses going camel racing the next day and she was going to help me, okay. so she knew she had to be back and be up early. Mm -hmm. So she left, um, friends left, and I went to bed. And um, the morning came and it was about seven o'clock I sat there and I thought I'll wake her up in about an hour Aww. and as we, as was usual I always woke her up with music so I'd walk in playing my phone just <laughs> dancing along and you know that's how we'd start our day it's by quite a nice way yeah to start exactly so instead of saying come on let's go I'd sort of she loved watching me dance and we'd just be silly with each other and so I was playing this music I opened the door and her bed was not touched I thought, that's very strange. She's either got up and left or what, I'm not really sure what's happened. So I started calling her phone, no reply, continuously calling her phone. And I said to Don, have you seen Raf? He hadn't seen her. So um, it got to about nine o'clock. I started calling all of her friends. I knew, I said, have you seen Raf? No, I haven't seen Raf. So yeah. you're now... In quite a panic. I, 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 yeah. And I said to Don, I said, we need to go to the police. Um, I can't see, you know, what, you know, what, what could have happened. So I, um, sorry. Okay. So we went to the police and uh, walked in and they said, um, you know, sit down, you know, what's the problem? I said, lost my daughter. Here's, copy of her passport on my phone, here's a photograph, sit down. So I had to sit down, wait, wait half an hour, they're mumbling to each other. Um, half an hour goes by, I said, look, can you tell us what we need to do? You know, I've, I don't know where she is. And this toing and fro went on for the best part of three or four hours. We waited there until about, probably about four o'clock, so we'd been there a good mm -hmm. six, six yeah. and a half hours, getting nowhere. And I just turned to Don and I said, I think we need to go and go to the hospital. I think we need to go and start exploring ourselves because they're obviously not going to help us. They either know something or they, you know, they're completely incompetent. So then you leave the police station, then you start going so to the city's hospital. We go to Hamad Hospital and um, walk to the front desk and I said, you know, we're looking for this person. I have a photograph of her passport on my phone. I said, we're looking for this person. The lady shrugs her shoulders and kind of points me to accident and emergency. And so we walked a little bit further back and um, there was a doctor who'd just taken over that shift. And I said, look, can you help us please? We're trying to find 
somebody. I don't know where we're supposed to go. The lady on reception isn't helping. She may or may not be in this hospital, but the police can't help me. And he was, you know, a very kind doctor and he allowed us to look through... Sorry, he allowed us to look through the um, entry uh, log and it uh, various names of people and then it had uh, one entry, it said one uh, female, um, unknown, DOA, and then it was um, one twenty am something like that. My husband remembers the right time. And uh, I said, what, what does DOA mean? And he said, uh, it's dead on arrival. And I, I thought, no, that, that just can't be her. I mean, everybody, she had a passport with her. It wouldn't be an unknown female. We, you know, we had uh, um, all sorts of means of communicating with her and, you know, it wouldn't be an unknown person. Um, so... After having kind of exhausted everything there, I said, well, I feel the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around the hospital myself because if it's not an emergency entry, then it's possibly, you know, she's broken a leg or something. I'm not really sure. So I'm going to walk, and I walked all the way around the hospital, literally peeling sheets. I'm really sorry. I'm looking for my daughter. I'm re Have you seen this person? Have you seen this person? That was probably about two hours of... You walking around, around yeah, hospital. around myself and, and my husband. We were just walking around going, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. Uh, nobody had seen her. Um, and then we we sat in the reception going, OK, well, what do we do now? And we both looked at each other and went, let's eliminate that entry in the book um, and, and then we'll go home and then figure out what our next plan of action is. So um, we walked to the mortuary... Um, I opened the door and there was a doctor writing in the book and she had a photocopy of my daughter's passport next to her. Goodness. And uh, I, I just started panicking. I said, why, why have you got my daughter's... Why have you got a photograph of my daughter's passport? And uh, I, I, I've repeated this so many times that I've never seen somebody so cold and dismissive in my life. She kind of looked up and said, uh, Britannia, you know, British in Arabic. And I said, yes. And indicated to the steel drawers and said, you know, you want to see? And, uh, sorry. Watch out. And so she walked us over to the steel drawers, just opened the drawer out. Okay. Peeled back the plastic. And there's my daughter's body. All injured. I'm completely unprepared for this. And, um... Sorry. I'm so sorry, Jane. I'm completely unprepared for this. And I, I didn't get, you know, any amount of compassion whatsoever. Neither of us would know what to do at this point. We'd both frozen. Um, and I'm, you know, I don't know whether I fell down. I don't know what I did. I just, the whole world started spinning. Mm. And... I'm looking at Raph and I start stroking her head. And I kept saying, no mother should go through this. Um, so, um, we kind of looked at her and she kind of went, here's paper. And I went, what are we supposed to do with that? Go to the police and collect her things. It was unbelievably cold. Oh, Joe, I'm so sorry. Um... And that, and that's the beginning of a three-and-a-half-year merry-go-round that we've been... No answers. When did it become clear to you that they were not investigating fully or competently what had happened to Raffi on that night? Immediately. Right. Because 
there's cameras on every single corner of every street in Doha and Qatar, so they know exactly what's going on everywhere. And then what happened with the man that was driving the car that, that struck Rafi? It took a long time for the prosecutors to go after this person. So he was eventually convicted of... Mm. Um, fleeing the scene, causing death, um, dangerous driving, and was given two months, which we have no evidence that he's ever done, and I think it was just paying... I think they just wanted to placate us and just go, well, you know, OK, we've done something for you now, go away. So he, ha he was given two months, you have no idea whether he even served that? No. Uh, how did you feel when that verdict was announced? Appalled. Appalled. He was driving 120 miles an hour. Um, and then and he fled the scene. And fled the scene. But they have a two-tier legal system. There's one for Qataris and one for everybody else. Now, had that been a foreign national, he would have been locked up immediately. And, Joe, what does the experience of what you had, you had, your experience in the aftermath of Rafi's death, tell you about Qatari society? You, you were happy there, and then obviously after this happened, I can't stay there, I can't be here. Yeah. So I saw a very ugly side to the place, mm. very ugly. Um, you, you get kind of undercurrents of, you know, behave and, um, you know, you're welcome here. If you say anything out of place or if you criticise the government or if you criticise the emir, then you are definitely in trouble. Mm. So I always was aware of the fact that we had to respect the country, and I always did. Mm. Um, but then once this happened, um, we saw a completely different mm. side to the place. And now, billions of us what, you know, around the world are watching the World Cup, and we're seeing Qatar host that World Cup. It's a huge moment for the country. When you see British sporting icons like David Beckham promoting Qatar or perhaps trying to put a gloss on the country's image, what do you think? What do you think? How does it make you feel? It's all about money. All these people are paid. Qatar buys everything it wants, including people. So people name their price and they go out there and they do what they're told. And that's, you know, a lot of expats are being paid quite well and won't speak there as well because it is all about money, money talks. If anyone watching this tonight is thinking of visiting the country to see it for themselves, what would, what would your advice to them be? So many people do go and visit and nothing happens to them, but you do need to be aware of certain things that, as somebody who's lived in the country and knew her way around for us not to be able to get any justice or any form of uh, closure, then I have no idea how anybody visiting would ever be able to get any support. Um, so go there with your eyes wide open. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, we've come to a time in our evolution where we need to kind of call these people to account and go, no, we're not, we're not going to tolerate this, you know. You can't do this to people anymore. That's, you know, we're in 2022. We're not in the medieval area where we go around doing what we want to people. Everybody's accountable for their actions. And you can't put on a world event like the um, World Cup and then expect, you know, people to be treated so appallingly. OK. And thank you, Jo. Thanks thank for, you. I know it's not easy. Thanks for talking to thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe's story there. Well, we did reach out to the Qatari government and the Qatar embassy in London to get their view on the case, but they did not respond. The Foreign Office, however, told us, we have provided support to the family of a woman who died in Qatar in 2019 and raised her case with the Qatari authorities at a senior level. We stand ready to offer further consular assistance as appropriate. Well, thank you to Jo for sharing the story and her memories of her daughter, Rafi, and also to my first guest, Wendy Sherman. And if you scan this QR code on screen right now, you can watch all of our interviews online and all of the previous episodes 
of the show. And you can listen to the Beth Rigby Interviews podcast by scanning that QR code on your screen right now. A new episode's available each week as I take a look at the highlights of the interviews and there's a few extra bits and pieces in it too. That's on the Sky News app or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, that's all for this week's show. Thank you, as ever, for watching. Mm -hmm.